in 2017, I was at the Route 91 Music Festival at the mass shooting on October 1st, 2017. I was there with a friend in the 10 minutes that we were hunkered down behind a tour bus, so much moved through me and realized that all the things I had been seeking, all the measures of success, they weren't there for me. I realized that if I didn't make it out of that moment, that I was really sad and disappointed that I had played the game and I had won, but I was playing the wrong game. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. My guest today, Cal Callahan, and this guy, I've been following him for following him for a bit. We have a mutual connection with Dennis Meralda. Yeah, um, loves you. Said hi to you, by the oh, way. Great. He wanted to he's make sure. A I, sweet, sweet. He's man. incredible. He's yeah. incredible. The Great Unlearned Podcast. Um, I love the title. I love the concept. I love everything about it. And we'll dive into you know what you had to unlearn as we go here. But um, but amazement. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for coming to Austin. Thanks for asking me to come on. I, I love this and excited. Uh, I don't often get on uh, podcasts that have this type of uh, kind of bent on it. Mm. And so it's one of the things with my podcast, a lot of people want to know, like, talk about, you know, like investing. And I know that it, it's not all about that, but there are parts of my life that I just don't really get to share that much. Mm. And so much has shifted for me over the last number of years that I always in, enjoy kind of uh, engaging in those conversations. What don't you get to share? That's a great question. <laughs> no, I, I think um, many people ask me for investment advice. Mm. And, uh, you know, like many things, they want the, the the quick answer and something they can go execute. And, you know, the biggest thing that I found, I was a trader for 18 years. I was on the floor of the exchange. I dealt with a lot of risk and became really comfortable with that. And so my style of investing is much different than the, the everyday person that would, you know, kind of enter that space. Um, and so what I always tell people is like, well, you put on a level of risk and that's depending on, um, you know, everybody obviously over the last number of years has wanted to get into crypto. I got into it too. Me too, I'm at the high. Yeah, well, I, I got it along the way and I did get some at the high, unfortunately. But I always went into it with the idea that it could go to zero. Yeah. I don't think that's likely, but mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't put more than I was willing to um, have go to zero. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as you know, you've heard horror stories, like a lot of people didn't have that strategy. Right. And so they're left finding second jobs, doing things I don't want to do because they put themselves in a, in a real financial pinch. It's not that I don't do that in certain ways where I was like, oh, I kind of got over my skis on this one. But it's really what allows you to lay your head on your pillow at night and go to sleep. Mm. And if your uh, portfolio is putting you in a position where it's really uncomfortable when you're thinking about it all the time, there's there's something that needs to shift. And the same thing happened to me in trading. You know, I would carry positions at times that I'd be up all night looking at the market, seeing where it was going. And it wasn't as simple as, as flipping the position in the next day, but I knew that was my indication that something needed to shift because I didn't want to live that way. Some people enjoy that. I, I, I didn't love it. I could manage it for a while, but it was the, yeah, it was the indicator for me that I had two, I had more on than I was comfortable with. Mm. So it's, you know, I think that's probably the biggest thing I, I would share with people who ask that question. I don't pick stocks. I don't do any of that. I, I do what I'm comfortable with, which is playing in a lot of a different arenas. I, I really enjoy investing in, um, I don't want to say startups. I've done that before. Um, I like to come in series A. There's some revenue coming in. I, I get a clearer picture. I feel like a, a decent amount of the risk is mitigated. I've been in too many in the beginning that either A, didn't make it, 
or the next round or two was raised at a similar similar valuation or just a little bit higher where you know the first guy in is taking all the risk and yeah. so those are some of the things that I try to carry forward um but I love investing in in brands and brands that are uh products that I love um that's something that's really shifted for me I think early on I uh I didn't want to miss out mm. and uh, whatever the, you know, the big, uh, the big investment was of the time. It was like, I don't want to miss the next Facebook. I don't want to, whatever it was. And I, I wasted, a, I don't want to say wasted. I spent a lot of money learning that lesson. Mm -hmm. And so now I try to stay focused on, do I love the brand? Would I, would I share this brand enthusiastically with people that I know whether I had money invested or not. Mm -hmm. Do I have a resonance with the founders? Do I trust them? Mm -hmm. um, there is a due diligence period that happens, obviously, but that's not the first thing I need though. I need to check those two boxes. And if I do, then I can go deeper into it and it becomes less about the outcome of the exit with the the company. And again, that is something that has shifted in a big way for me, it was always like, mm, this deck says they could have a 10 X in three years. And, and I know enough now that that's all make believe. Mm -hmm. Um, the brands that I've gotten involved in lately, there's a part of me that, that I, I don't, uh, I'm, I don't want to say I don't want the exit. I do. But there's uh, there's a part of me that is so present with the journey that we're on that I know when the exit comes that, that that's over mm. and we we close that chapter, um, which is great. That's the the outcome you want, but um, it's no longer just looking into the future. When are we going to get paid on this? What's the exit going to be? And um, it makes it uh, a much more enjoyable ride. I'm not tied to the outcomes anymore. And I sure. think that's something I learned just through my own life experience that was so goal oriented and looking into the future and not being with what was happening and enjoying the ride. Interesting. Uh, was there a pivot point on that, on that whole concept, whether it's within your investment strategy or your life strategy, you left a big job. So when did you get to this, you know, process versus outcome realization what was was there a trigger or was it just sort of a gradual gradual knowledge that you gained you know it was interesting i if i had to bring it down to kind of one point experience it would be i i would say it was the near the the fall of 2020 i had spent i don't know 4 to 6 months with a small brand and I was going to be their first outside money. And, uh, I really loved the product. I liked the guys. And then as we got closer to signing the agreement, they just started to change a few things. And it, it seemed like they had had a little more success than they thought. And, and, instead of allowing me to buy up to 20%, I was going to buy 10% originally, and then I wanted an option to buy another 20. They said, well, we only want you to buy 5% right now, and, mm. and this is the valuation. They raised the valuation on me. It's like, listen, if you want me to buy 5% and cap it there for now, you need to lower the valuation because I'm getting less skin in this game. And I, I just realized that there was... Um, something that wasn't aligned with where we were trying to meet in the middle. Mm. At the same time, that opportunity, um, I decided to pass on it. The same day, a close friend of mine, I don't know if you've met Colin Gwynn before, he's in Austin here. No. Definitely part of uh, this circle, a lot of the, the men that are in the GoBundance group. Um, he said, look, I'm ready to take on some money for gel blasters. And at that point, uh, he had launched the brand. He had self-funded. I loved the brand. Colin's one of my closest friends. And I said, look, if you're ever looking to take money, like 
I, I'm in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand if you don't, like if you just want to self fund this, like I get it. it. You've got a great, great product and you're on a nice, you know, you have a nice trajectory already. And that same day he reached us and I'm ready to take money. Hmm. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And around the same time I invested in uh, a product called Feel Free, which, uh, have you had that before? No, it's Gel a, Blasters too. I'm curious what those are. Both yeah, yeah, so uh, Feel Free is a kava-based tonic that has a little bit of kratom in it. Hmm. And so it's kind of like a five-hour energy um it, it it kind of checks a lot of boxes. It gives you focus, it gives you energy, and also gives you a sense of calm. That's the kava. Mm. So whether you're having, you know, a conversation with somebody, maybe you're having a difficult conversation with your wife, your partner, it allows you to open the heart and, and be truly connected in a different way. It's also great for golf because <laughs> you're focused you, you you feel good and then you have a sense of calm. So any nerves you may have, if you're playing for money or you're playing in a tournament, um, you know, I've, I've turned some, some pro golfers onto it and they absolutely love it. What if you hate golf? Would it help that for me? Yes. I want to love golf. I want to love golf and I want to love wine, but I just can't bring myself to do it. They both fucking suck. And they both <laughs> have their downside for sure. It would definitely, uh, it would make golf a more enjoyable experience. Okay. Yeah, because sometimes with golf, there's so much analyzation that goes on, especially if you're just learning or even for someone like me who's played for a long time, it's just overanalyzing the swing. What am I doing wrong? And it just puts you at ease and you're more in the flow of things. Mm. And Gel Blasters is, think, uh, paintball, Nerf gun, smashed together. No, oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they, instead of shooting you know, uh, paintballs or Nerf, it's uh, these little gelets, which you've maybe seen. Uh, and it's super fun. These are going? Are these blowing up? Are these? They're both doing really well. That's awesome. And exciting and growing. And um, right around the same time as Gel Blasters, I, I had um, invested in Feel Free. And it, I was sitting in the sauna one day. And all this kind of occurred to me. I was like, oh, it's not about the outcome anymore. I, I, I realized that when I write a check to someone, I'm actually giving a part of me. And so I'm involved mostly passively, but there's, there's an energy for me that's, that's a part of that. And so what do I really want to be a part of? What do I want my, you know, the money that I've earned to support? And it's just like shifted the lens of, getting out of the numbers uh, and really thinking about there is a piece of me and I just had never thought about it that way. Neither have I. I like what you just said. Putting my putting my money is putting a piece of me in it. That's incredible because I, I get in that analysis paralysis with stuff. I tend to I tend to stick to my tried and true, which is real estate, both actively and passively. But like I've invested in a coffee company and I, I did it honestly, mostly because I don't know anything about coffee. I don't even really, I just started drinking coffee. Literally in the last week, I just started drinking coffee. No way. Yeah, no shit. I, I've always, again, wine, uh, these things that people all say are amazing. Yeah. Wine, golf, coffee. Coffee, <laughs> I, got, I got more because I've, I've learned so much about like the antioxidants uh, in coffee. It's I, I'm drinking it just purely black. It's less about, yeah. you know, uh, getting a Starbucks, whatever, because it's tasty and sugary and more, hey, it gives me energy instead of maybe a pre-workout supplement in the morning. It's a, it's a more natural you know, caffeine to give me energy and the antioxidants that you get from it. Um, but yeah, invest in this coffee company mostly because I understood it enough. And like you said, I, I put in what I felt was, well, if I lose it, I'm okay with it. I don't want to. I might have gotten a lot because I had crypto in there as well. I might have gotten like total portfolio a little too more risky than I need to need to be. But when, Hand you, up. I did the, right. done the same thing over the last year. Yeah, when you combine it all. Yeah, but like, oh, a shit. lot of guys, a lot of guys invested in it. A lot of smart guys. And I talk to them. Like, these are guys that yeah, that understand consumer products, that understand all of this stuff. Uh, but I never thought of it that way, that I'm putting a piece of myself into this business. It was literally, what's the pro forma? Does it make sense? Do other smart people invest in it? And now I'm kind of enjoying the, it's doing well. And I'm enjoying the idea of being kind of part of this brand. I, I hadn't put that together before. Yeah, and I think it, it, the other thing you added is when you have other smart people who maybe w w what their their you know their real genius is 
being able to vet these investments, you hop on board with them and you get to learn on something that's less risky than if you were just taking a look at a pro forma yourself. And yeah. I think that's really helped me is seeing who else is interested, having conversations with them. And then if I really don't know, I have a few trusted, you know, advisors that I can shoot them these deals and say, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think it's, it's, um, you know, yeah, bringing in that, that tribe and, and really the only way you really learn in, in this space is through, you know, putting some skin in it. Sure. Yeah. And, applied knowledge, right? Like you have yeah. to actually go in and do it. So I'm curious if you don't mind, like, I just want to di dive in a little bit on talking about brands. Like you've got an amazing brand, the great unlearn, the podcast, I and mean, you've had like Lance Armstrong, you have an amazing guest on that podcast. Where does that come in? So I, I'm, how do I, how do I phrase this? You're investing, you're an investor by nature. It seems like you've got that, 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 uh, that, uh, DNA. Maybe you, you, you were on the Chicago exchange. You leave that, you know, when I think about myself leaving a job, a big job, I, I, I can resonate with the, you talk about risk, like the risk you might feel in doing so, but it just, I was compelled to, you were compelled to. So flash forward. Now you've got the great unlearned podcast. Talk to me first about what was the motivation for it and what do you seek to, what are you unlearning? What are people unlearning as a result of this podcast? Yeah, it really came out of um, uh, an event in 2017. I was at the Route 91 Music Festival at the mass shooting on October 1st, 2017. And so I was there with a friend and, uh, you know, in the, 10 minutes that we were hunkered down behind a tour bus, I just so much moved through me and realized that all the things I had been seeking, all the, the um, measures of success that I think a lot of us are, are told are, are the fulfilling, uh, it's the fulfilling path in our lives. Uh, they, they weren't there for me. Mm. And I realized that if I didn't make it out of that moment, that I was really sad and disappointed that um, I had played the game and I had won, but I was playing the wrong game. And so get out, obviously make it out of there. And two days later, I happened to uh, go down to do a, a NAD, um, supplement IV. And I don't know if you're familiar with that at no. all, but it's NAD plus has been known to, um, regenerate your mitochondria. Uh, it's anti-aging. There's mm. a lot of great benefits to it. And so I had done some of it months earlier. I had just gotten back from summer where I wasn't really taking great care of myself. So I set up doing this eight day kind of loading dose of it. Uh, and it just so happened it was two days after this, this experience at that, um, you know, the other people in, in the room were Aubrey Marcus, Lance Armstrong, Kyle Kingsbury, Tim Ferriss. So here I am, I just had this experience and a, a lot is, you know, kind of awakened in me and I'm in this room with guys who are already on the journey mm. and just being a, mostly a fly on the wall to their conversations about, you know, psychedelics. Why are we here? Uh, you know, them talking about their podcasts. And I really, I developed a really close relationship with Kyle and I don't know if you knew Kyle at all, but he's, uh, of those names you mentioned, that's the one I didn't recognize. Yeah, he used yeah. to be a, an MMA fighter in the UFC, but has since he moved here to Austin, maybe in 2000, I guess right around then, 2017, and worked with Aubrey at On It, and he's um, just doing a lot of great work in the world. He has his own podcast, but um, really just a curious soul. What's it, Kyle, what was it? Kingsbury. I'll look him up. But continue, sorry. Yeah, so Kyle became the portal for me to really explore what this other game. Dude, is jacked. Yeah, he's a big fella. <laughs> yeah. God, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, and he's as lovable as they come. 
but that was the thing is like this idea that I'm playing the wrong game and Kyle was was there to really show me what the 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 real game is in 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 my opinion and uh he didn't say it as you know kind of directly as that but just by how he was living his life I was just really drawn to him and had endless resources for me to explore this and so I would say that started me on the journey of what am I really here to do? Because it's not for the things that I thought. And it's what were the things that you thought when at that point to make a lot of money. That's it. And yeah. you know, have that kind of success and be in really good shape. And um, it's nothing wrong with these things, but they're for me. They didn't fill the void of purpose for me. Hmm. They were a kind of a means to it, and I would never say, "Don't try to," you know, "Don't be fit" or don't try to make a lot of money or, or any of those things, but just understand that it might not be all that you think it's going to be in the end. Mm. And so, you know, I guess since then I've been on this journey and I would say probably two years in, I just had this r realization that I was learning so much from people that I wouldn't necessarily be around normally uh, that I wanted to share their life experience, their wisdom of how they have done things differently than we're told to do them, whether it's through school or, you know, our parents, you know, God bless them. They're doing the, they were doing the best they could, but it, it, they were so limited in their life experience that uh, I wanted to open people up to that. Mm -hmm. And it was really like, look, I know people who know me think, I won or was winning that first game and that's cool, but that's not the game in, like I said, in, in my opinion. And so I wanted to share with people, um, a lot of people who are feeling like me, this dissatisfaction of fuck, I, I, I keep making more money and it's not changing anything. Things aren't getting better. Yeah. So inviting them into like, Hey, you're not the only one that's, you know, going through this. And so to share my experience and to bring people on that could give people context for what that other game looks like and how to explore it and, you know, take what you want from the podcast. But, you know, it's there as, as just the life experience kind of sharing. I don't generally bring on experts in different areas, <laughs> right. right? It's like, yeah. I want to know, what makes you different yeah. and what it was that changed for you and um, allow people to take, I love take what they will. That's what I honestly, I, I hope to do with this podcast as well. And, and, you know, we have the tie in of what you just described, who you surround yourself with can propel you forward. And you mentioned names, big names, people that I, of course recognize Tim Ferriss, of course recognize Aubrey Marcus. Um, now I know Cliff, who was the other one? Um, you said another name. It was a bigger name. Was it Lance? Lance. Yeah, Lance. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the biggest of the yeah, four. Sure. Um, but it's so funny you say that. I, it, again, we we briefly talked uh, before, but when I got the job that I thought was the job, the big equity, the big bonus, the big salary, all of that stuff, it, I became miserable within 30 days. Miserable. Mm -hmm. It was the, the thing I thought I wanted. The game that I was playing was for the money. And, you know, I mean, to secure my family, to have, you know, financial security for the future and all of that stuff. But fucking hollow, man, completely hollow. It was an amazing, crazy, unbelievable feeling. Depression for a year followed by, you know, a level of action, which stacked on top of itself and surrounding myself with the right people led to, you know, a major change in my life. What's funny for me, and I want to get this from you, is when I left my job, my brand almost became about, well, how do you do that at 42 years old? How do you walk away from three, 400 grand a year in a corporate gig and then, you know, like your wife has a big job. Like, no, my wife, stay at home, mom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've got a trust fund. No, saved a little money, had a little money on the side, you know, coming in. And I just sort of had a belief in myself that that grew. And I, I find it hard to explain to the practical brain because we've mm -hmm. all been there. You and your job was, I and my job was the practical brain, how, you know, there's, uh, yes, it, I, I can't give you the formula. I can't give you the formula for I replaced my every other week paycheck by doing X, Y, and Z or whatever. It was more, I had a little bit here, a little bit there, and then full faith in what I think I could achieve. How are you doing that? 
today. You're investing. But when you invest in some of these deals, I'm assuming that's more of like, like you said, you put your money and you put yourself in it. And then one day it'll pay off and you might take that and roll it into the next investment, kind of building your your asset wealth, I assume, unless there's tremendous cash flow in these deals. I don't know. No, generally there's not much cash flow right? in any of the deals. Exactly. Like they, these are all delayed gratification sort of investments. So totally. how, do you, how do you do it then? How do, how are you doing it? What, what You were coaching for a bit, whatever, but like what when somebody says, how do you how do I leave my job? I'm, I'm completely empty, 38 years old with three kids and a wife at home or a husband or whatever it is. How do I do this mm. and make money? What are you doing or what advice do you give? It's a great question. And again, I think my, my case is a little different because I had done really well as a trader. And so I had made a, a lot of money. Yeah. And so when I invest, I, I know that I've invested in things. I mean, I've been investing for almost 25 years. I just had an investment that I invested in in 2007 that wow. just hit uh, last year. Yeah. So 15 years. All the while I have some real estate stuff that turns over a little more quickly. Sure. And so I just try to forecast the best I can when these things will hit. And then there's a lump sum that comes in and I just manage that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, from time to time, I have an idea that, oh, this coming year, these things should pay out and I'll have that amount of money to, to work with. And it doesn't happen for whatever reason. And so then I get a little bit, you know, cash poor mm -hmm. and I have to tighten things up and maybe sell a few things or, you know, be nimble. But for me, it's, again, it, it's, I'd love to come back to, you know, you're 38 years old, you have three kids, you hate your job and like, what do you do? And I think that's such a difficult situation to be in. I think the first thing is to start paying attention to the things that really light you up. Like when I was transitioning from trading, I loved all the stuff around coaching and I was doing it for myself and I was finding myself for I mean, that was 2013. So for probably the past five years, I had been into that. And I knew that that was a direction I wanted to go. I thought I wanted to open a gym and get into the, you know, the fitness business in, in that way. And, and had even started to look at different properties and realize that like, that's not the version that I want mm. um, for me. But I knew there was something around health and fitness. Soon after that, maybe a month later, this opportunity with the National Pro Grid League came about and it was like, oh, this is how I'm meant to be in health and fitness. And then that lasted for two years. And and after that, it was like, oh, I like, actually, I, I want to be in community with people. I want to work together, collaborate. Um, and so how how does that look in the world? And I, I really, again, none, none of my investments really cash flow. So it's all dependent upon exits. And so I just had to be patient with what I was doing. And at that time I was still investing in things that maybe weren't the wisest decisions. Um, and it really wasn't until probably three years ago, two, three years ago that I, that I woke up to this new idea of, of really, um, it, it came from me finally believing that I, I deserved what I had earned. And I think there's a part of me that felt like I, didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of getting in right relationship with that allowed me to really feel like when I write a check, I'm a part of me is going with that. And and the same thing goes for my time. When, when I give my time to someone, I, I really value it. So it, it, it's meaningful versus I have a lot of free time. So why don't I just spend it with whoever wants it? You know, I think I've, you know, I've been in that phase before and that, yeah, yeah it just doesn't feel good. Right. And so I think just having that, uh, that feeling of self, that really notion that you're, that you deserve, you deserve all of it, good and bad, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, the, the tougher stuff is like, I deserve this because there's some learning in this for me. And um, those are obviously much more difficult to deal with but that's for me that's where the real growth comes from when i can you know make it through those hard times and stay in them 
um, rather than check out and just be like, okay, I know there's something around the corner that will show me what I meant to learn. And I just need to stay with it. That's amazing. I want to dive into that in a second. Something you said a moment ago, uh, I think about the, you know, from a context of your, a context of your brand unlearning something that's learned, I think, at least for me was, uh, and I think for a lot of people it was, you got to pick and go, you got to pick a lane. Right. And I think there's, you think about, you know, uh, education is 13 years of primary school or whatever you want to call it. Then four years ago, so you had 17 years of your life in that lane. Yeah. Then you pick a corporate career and you've got whatever for me, 20 years in that lane. So for people, I know for me, exiting is like, okay, well, what's the next 20 years? And what you said resonated a ton with me that I had to unlearn. What I learned was I got to pick 20 years, the next 20 years. So if I commit to, I'm a real estate investor, then that's what I am. Cause I told everybody around me and I don't oh, want to yeah. look crazy. I, you know, I want to jump around and everything, but those pivots and being okay with those pivots. Like you said, you started down the coaching route. You thought brick and mortar, I'm going to open a fitness business, but that wasn't what you did. Instead you bought a, 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 a professional team. Like it's just, yeah. you know, like who knows what's going to come about, but being okay with the idea that version 1.0 will be different than version 12.0 was a big unlearn for me. Do you see that with a lot of the people that you talk to? Is that something that is common amongst them or yeah, kind of curious on that? Yeah. I think that's a massive piece of it. Um, so again, I kind of mentioned earlier, like being goal oriented, we, we do, we pick that lane that we think is the right lane to get us to that particular outcome, that end point. And we miss all the signs along the way that say, no, we just, you need to go down this path right now. And, um, great, great dear friend of mine, Boyd Vardy wrote a book called the lion trackers guide to life. And it's, I highly recommend it. I've probably given out 300 copies of it. It is, it's amazing. And it, part of what Boyd talks about in this book is, is presence, but he, he goes into the kind of many different ways that we can be present. And it's just like giving yourself, pointing yourself in the right direction and allowing for your presence in that, the things that are alive in you follow those things and the things that make you constrict avoid those things. And when we can tune into that, life just becomes a lot more easier because we're not trying to chart out the next 20 years or 10 years or even five years. We're just open to what's coming into our space. And the more we open up, the more stuff we attract that is really what we want mm. versus head down. I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm committed to it. I mean, a thing you just said is that was deeply resonant for me. Uh, I told everybody I was going to do this, so I need to do it. Right, right. I had told everybody I was going to open up a brick and mortar. <laughs> yeah. And I had all these feelings like, oh, I'm a fraud. I'm not going to do it now. Wait, what do I do? And fortunately, I had a great coach at the time, and she's like, you can change your mind. It's okay. Honestly, no one, no, no one really cares anyway. But give yourself some grace. You thought you were clear on what it was. And now that's not the thing. And because that's not the thing, I was open to other things. And the, the national pro grid league came about. And I mean, listen, I lost a good chunk of money in that, but I learned so much about what I love and that I love being, you know, in connection with people. Like I was I was the owner of the team, but I really, I really wanted to support these young athletes and almost be like a mentor or a father figure to them. And I really enjoyed that relationship. And there was a lot I was learning from them as well, but there were things that I could share with them and, and really try to take care of them to allow them to perform, you know, on the, on the grid. And so I would say that you know, that's been a bit, a bit of the, the journey is like really trying to, to zoom out. It doesn't mean you don't have some goals that you want to set. Sure. Um, now I don't necessarily set goals, but done in the right way, as long as you're not just so tied to that particular outcome, because it's really limiting. We don't know. We have no idea how things are going to happen tomorrow. Um, Man, I hope that was one of the big lessons that people have have received over the last three years is hmm. nothing's guaranteed. We have no idea. Things can change in an instant. And so be aware, 
get your head out of the sand um, and pay attention. And I think head in that direction and just let let the 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 true purpose, your true purpose, just let it emerge. And it's going to continue to emerge. And as you said, it's like your version 2.0 right now, you don't know how many versions there are going to be. Allow for there to be many yeah. or not even think of it as a version. Like that's just another that's way point. we identify and label. But no, but it's a great point. But it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really easy to do that. I do the same thing. And yeah. it's like, what if I don't identify as anything and I'm just here? Mm. Yeah. I love that, man. I want to get into embracing the suck, but real quick, just to clean this up, pro, I, I'm unclear on this. Pro Grid? What is that? What is a gr Grid League? So the National Pro Grid League, it was, uh, it was, there were eight teams and it was like LA, San Fran, New York, Miami, Philly, a few other, uh, Boston had a team and uh, men and women. Mm-hmm. You owned Austin? I owned, I actually, Phoenix. Phoenix, got it. Yeah, we didn't have a team here in Austin. And uh, men and women on the team. And there were, there were nine of, or I'm sorry, there were 11 events or what we would call races. And the total format was about an hour and 45 minutes. So made for TV, the grid where everything was performed it was the size of a basketball court, so it would easily go in any kind of stadium or arena. And you accumulate points. Every race is basically worth two points for the winner, one point for the loser, so on and so forth. Mm. And um, I think there's still some old videos on YouTube. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was amazing. It was a great sport. We had a lot of fun. Um, just didn't execute at the you know, kind of higher level to, you know, part of the, part of the issue was the, the founder came from CrossFit mm. and he, I believe he just really wanted to make a big splash and spent a lot of money, mm -hmm. um, partly as an FU to CrossFit. <laughs> and, um, I think we could have done, we could have done it differently yeah. and had it a little bit more grassroots started this and then you know we had an nbc sports contract in the first year which was great but you know all we had to do like we had to dude i i had to have one of our matches at the arena where the uh the i guess at the time i think they were the phoenix coyotes and now they're arizona but it cost like 70 grand to rent it wow and it's we weren't a big sport, right, so I don't right. even know how many fans we had there. Maybe fifteen hundred. Yeah, and it was it was just it was too much. Mm -hmm. We needed to be much smaller. Um, we ended up going for three seasons. It happened over two years, and the third season we started to get it right, um, but it was too late at that yeah. point. We kind of run out of money. Yeah. Makes sense. That's interesting. I'll have, to, I'll have to Google that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. What's up, everybody? It's Jamie. You're listening to this podcast because you want to think and you want to live differently. And if you haven't already, the way to get that done as fast as possible is by joining GoBundance at any level. We're the community that you've been searching for with six incredible pillars around contribution, health, relationships, accountability, adventure, horizontal income, Unbelievable pillars that we do everything around in this incredible community. You can experience the power of being in the best physical shape you can be, having a supportive tribe, achieving your bucket list items, having a community of peer partners, giving back and building a lifetime, a lifetime of wealth. So I hope you join us. Join this tribe. Don't sit on the sidelines any longer. As we go into uncertain times, join the tribe where you can find the people and the resources you need to see you through. Go to GoBundance.com fill out an application and we'll figure out the right community for you, whether it's Emerge, Elite, Champion, or GoBundance Women's, GoBundance.com. Check it out today. Back to the show. Talk about embracing the suck a little bit or staying in the suck. I like this concept. Why is that? You've talked about this. I've heard you talk about this before, how you know this is maybe something where people want to get out of it as quickly as possible as opposed to staying there. Why is it so important, in your opinion, that people do stay in that suck? For one, for me, it... it it kind of reinforces this idea that I am resilient and that I, that, that this too shall pass. And those are just words until you've been through experiences like that. And you realize that you're going to be okay. That as 
bad as this seems right now, and it may get worse, you just need to stay in it and make good decisions and not try to fix it. And I think that's a, a very masculine thing is to want to fix whatever the problem is. And the bigger ones, there's no fixing. They're just staying and there's going to be some deep learning for how you got there. Could be with your partner. It could be with your kids. It could be with business. Um, but for me, my, my greatest lessons have been just some of the hardest times in my life. Um, yeah. And believe me, I, I wanted to fix it. Mm. And it's not like I didn't think about fixing it. I tried like a motherfucker laying in bed trying to fix it. And, and I couldn't sleep. And I just finally surrendered. Like you're just in it right now, man. I mean, it's just time. You just need to be in it and, uh, and not check out and not run from it. Um, it doesn't mean you don't numb from it from time to time because you need a fucking break. Mm. Um, and yeah, you, you know, like on the one hand, you don't wish it for anybody, but at the same time, you would never want to rob. So I would never want to rob someone of that experience. You know, as an example, in that context, my son uh, broke his jaw his senior year of high school during basketball season. And um, his favorite sport, he loves it, loves being on the team. And um, in that moment, all I, I just wanted to be a good dad. I just want to be a good dad to him. I hurt so much for him. Because, like I said, it meant so much to him to play basketball. And so I did what we were talking about earlier. You know, I reached out to someone I trusted. I reached out to Boyd and I said, dude, this is what happened. And I sent him this email. It's like, this is all I'm feeling. And I just, just want to be a good dad. And you wrote a beautiful email back. And I actually read it on one of uh, one of the episodes where he came on. I forget which one, but all the ones where he's on are just amazing. So, But I read the email he sent to me. And one of the most important things was don't, don't rob Jake of this experience. Mm. There's so much learning in this for him to deal with this adversity. And... Um, don't assume anything. Let him tell you what he needs. Sometimes as parents, you get him right. Your kid's not feeling well. You just want to be around him. You know, a ask him, does he actually want you to be with him right now? Does he want to be by himself? And so I just learned so much about asking and not assuming and listening to my kids and not trying to override it with what I think he needs. And if he really needs me to be with him, but he's pushing me away, he'll learn that by me not being there, he actually wanted me there. And there was some other reason he didn't want me. So it's just, it, there's so much deeper than, you know, as parents, again, we just, I think we all just want to be good parents. And sometimes our actions just aren't, putting us in position to, to succeed in that way. And so it was amazing. We had an amazing experience. Um, he's told me many times since then, um, how grateful he is, how I showed up for him, you know? And so never want your kid to have an injury like that. Just never. Um, but there was a, a ton of learning in that for both of us. What's behind this for you? I've heard you talk about, I, I don't maybe use this word, like that you were a shitty parent for a number of years. This, this runs deep for you. Well, mm. Can you unpack that a little bit? Like when this, I, I mean, I, man, I'm feeling everything across <laughs> this table. I, I mean, I mean it. I, I, cause as a, I, my kids are young, but 
God, I fucked up so many times, especially I feel like with the older one, you know, I think about like the lessons learned with the first one versus the second one. And have I done like irreparable damage to that kid? Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, yeah, it hits me hard. So w where does this pressure come from on yourself? Like you feel this man, like, I, I mean, it's, I mean, this room is, it's palpable right now. Yeah, uh, the, this, 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 um, identity that you have as a parent, but I get this sense that, and, and again, listening to some of the stuff you've said, that um, that you may have feel like you've wasted some of your some of your time as a parent, like how if you could have that time back to do it differently. Where does all that come from? Yeah, I would say that I I um, was certainly a little bit more disengaged back when they were younger. Um, I was still trying to prove myself. Not that anybody needed me. My wife didn't need me to you know prove myself to her, but I felt this. You know, and it's still in me, this this idea that um, I'm here to support the family and I'm going to be the best at that. And unfortunately, that happens at the expense of the family, which is so fucked up. It is, right? You know, but the I intentions mean, are good. Yeah. Just want to be a good man. And, um, you know, I just found myself doing a lot of the parenting of assuming I knew what they needed and, you know, my, my word being the law, um, maybe not as strict as maybe my dad was. Same. Yeah. But, but I was turning into him. I didn't like that. Yeah. You know, and I'll say that I love my dad and I think my dad did an amazing job, you know, given how he was brought up and, um, he absolutely did the best he could. And there were things that, you know, with our relationship that are major reasons why I've had this financial success. There are also things in our relationship that I need to heal. Um, and so I think, you know, I know that I can't do anything. I would, I would love to, on some level, start over. Yeah. I see a lot of, uh, you know, my friends here in Austin, younger than me, who are just starting families. And I love what I see. You know, and there's a part of me that's like, God, I, I wish I had gotten it right back then. But I also understand that this is the journey that I've needed to be on. And thank God I'm aware of it today. Yeah. Um, I think my relationship with my kids is amazing and there's a lot of trust there. They feel like, I, I think they feel like they can tell me anything, you know, I want to speak on their behalf, but that's always, you know, as much as the, this other stuff, this first game really drives my day to day in some ways. At the end of the day, all all I really care about is is being a good dad, you know. And sometimes that that's you know, unfortunately, a a bigger priority than being a a great husband, you know. And I recognize that. And I know that's some of my own, um, again, work and healing that I need to do, you know. And I'm I'm a uh, a bit of uh, my attachment style is a bit avoidant. And so that doesn't work well. It's my wife. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there are reasons for it and that stuff that I'm working on. Um, and with the kids, my relationship with them, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily show up. It's different. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to be a good dad because the money doesn't mean shit. You know, do they, do they trust me? You know, do they, you know, I don't necessarily think like respect, right? Like, do they love me? Do they trust me? Um, yeah. Do they have faith in me? You, um, you went through an exercise. I think it was an exercise of being sort of a seven-year-old kid and, and having 
the feeling of, I guess, you or your dad, you know, speaking to you and then being that seven year old kid and feeling that aggression, feeling that that, you know, that, and, you know, you, you articulated how you felt about it, you know. And I love what you said in there. It's like, you know, I think you were saying about your father, like his intention may have been to make you the best man that he can. His intention may be to keep you safe. Right. But the approach makes you feel or or you decided to feel however you want to phrase that mm. um, like you're not enough, like you're a piece of shit, like all of that stuff. Right. When I saw that, I thought to myself, my kid being seven, about to turn eight, um, I complete I don't even have to go through the exercise and I completely get. Like you, that you articulating the exercise allowed me to go through it, which is a gift. So thank you for that. Mm. But then I thought, do I talk to my seven year old about that? You know, have that conversation with him. Would you? My instinct says no. And it's, it's only because at that age, um, it might not land like you want it to. <laughs> True. I think we we give our kids, unfortunately, too much credit for what they can absorb from yeah. what we share. Um, and so for me, it's it's much less about that. It's just like continuing to show up consistently with love mm -hmm. and with boundaries and letting them know that those boundaries are there because I love them and yeah, there's a safety element to that, but they also need to have their own experience. And so those boundaries move, sometimes they get a little leaky and you've got to pull them in. And, and so it's, this is, this is the hardest thing about parenting. It's, it's, it changes from day to day. And it's like, just it's again, what we've been talking about, just staying present with it and not having this hard and fast rule about, you know, how you're going to act as a kid. Um, doesn't mean you can't have, you know, rules that are to be followed, but, you know, I think just, just taking the time when something happens and really try to get out of them, what was going on with them. You know, my wife loves to say, he's not giving you a hard time. He's having a hard time. And so like, what's going on in the kid that made them feel they needed to do what they did? You know, and it's like really try to pull the shame away from what happened and like get to the core of what is um, kind of inducing this behavior. And I think just being curious around that stuff is, is you know, in my experience is the, is the best way to parent and they feel seen and heard. And I think that was one of the shortcomings of how I was doing it before is they didn't feel seen and heard. It was the the law and that was it we're not negotiating holy shit yeah yeah <laughs> you know and so i allow for some negotiation i want them to feel seen and heard it doesn't mean that i'm going to change my you know w w what what it's going to be but it may mm -hmm. i mean it does and i don't beat myself up if i if i uh allow them to to negotiate a better position for themselves yeah that's a good point. And I think about it, like if I am going to talk to him about this, it would be more me laying it on him. It's for me, not for him, right? Yeah. If I'm going to go to him and say, hey, buddy, I recognize this, you know, like it's more for me, for me. And it's okay. It, yeah. it, I think it's great, actually. I think that's one of the things that I've learned as a dad is when I've fucked up or done something that I would like to have a do over, I go to them and I say, look, I did not handle that well. I was scared and I shouldn't have done that or whatever. I, I try to give them context just so they understand that I'm not crazy, but like, you know, and just apologize for how I showed up or didn't show up. And I think that honesty and vulnerability with, with my kids has been really important in building that trust. Like, Oh yeah, dad doesn't think he's got it all figured out, yeah. you know, and he does hear us and he, he is willing to see our perspective and it's hard. There is such a different world that these kids are growing up in than we grew up in. And so it's like trying to understand it while also knowing that I won't fully understand it. And, um, you know, know that these devices aren't going anywhere. And so how do I work with that yeah. and not say, 
when I was a kid, I used to play outside. Like it, it's, that it doesn't hold any weight anymore. It doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, they always say, I, I heard somebody say this, it's so true. In, in 1950, they'd be like, these kids inside listening to the radio all day. You know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. there's always, always the generation before says how much, you know, better it was in our generation than these kids today. Like the next one's going to be, you know, people inside just on their chip all day. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Whatever the next generation yes. is going to be crazy. Um, I was going to ask you about, uh, uh, about, um, well, I, I had two questions, but I want to real quick, you touched on, uh, having an avoidant, uh, attachment style. What's your wife's? Do you know offhand? Does she, have you analyzed this with her? Oh, you had to ask me. Um, <laughs> My wife and I are, she's avoiding, I'm anxious. Yeah, she's anxious as well. So it's, how, how, do you manage that around, do you manage your relationship around that concept? And for, if somebody's listening and doesn't understand, so avoidant would be, there's what, four attachment styles, I think, right? There's there's uh, secure, which some people are. Yeah. There's anxious, which I think I am just by reading it. There's avoidant, which my wife is, and there's another one, I can't remember what it is, but um Avoidant would be, you know, when when under when under duress or pressure within the relationship, your your tendency is to run. Anxious would be the opposite. Your tendency is to smother. So when you've yeah. got a, an anxious and an avoidant person together, Just brutal. One's trying to run, the other one's running toward it. <laughs> it's so. How does that how does that work? In yeah, your so we ha we have been working <laughs> on it, um, and not like directly under under that kind of um, yeah structure structure, right. yeah. but. Uh, you know, I, I, I recognize that when I'm feeling her, uh, anxiousness and, <laughs> and I feel like it's because of me, Yeah, I don't say this all the time, but like oftentimes when I feel that I make myself invisible. So I'm busy with work. I'm doing this. I'll go sit in the sauna. I'll do anything to not be in the same room. Um, we've, we've been working at this. And so for my wife, she's done an amazing job of not just holding that. A lot of times she would feel that, that anxious kind of like energy yeah. and not say anything for a long time. So just continue to build and I would feel it and I would not say anything and I would just avoid. Um, she's done an amazing job of like taking that first step of like when something comes up for her, she comes to me and then I'm in it with her mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, let's, let's talk about this. Um, so we have a lot more conversations around that than we used to. There used to be a lot of buildup and a lot of resentment and a lot of avoiding and yeah. Um, that awareness of those, those attachments, it's recent for us within the last year. My wife is, um, uh, now that the kids are a little bit older, she's going back to finish her psychology uh, uh, graduate. What is it called? Her psychology, whatever degree. <laughs> sure, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've learned a lot. She's doing some undergrad work to finish up the prereq stuff, and we've learned a lot about this. And we've been talking about it. it's like, holy cow! I mean, I, I could pinpoint almost every major conflict that we've had, or it, it, like how it manifests in this, and how it's like this, this, uh, you know it's like it, it continues to stack on itself. Like if I'm, if I'm feeling like, you know, she's disconnected from me, I'm getting anxious. Like what's going on? Yeah. Maybe it's the fixer in me that wants to go in there and fix it, but I want to feel love. I want to hear that I'm loved. I want to make sure we're good. Right. I need that. I need that. I need that. And she's like, get me the fuck out of here. She's running the other way. So I'm, it's like, it's like the coyote and, uh, and road runner. Kind yes. Of thing, right? like run up. She's trying to get away. I'm running away. She meet meeps and then we're out, we're yeah. out there. But, yeah. Yeah. um, but it's an interesting concept to really, I don't know. Like you said, it's not like it's conscious, like, okay, right now you're being avoidant. I'm being anxious, or, mm -hmm. but just understanding it, you know, like when you run for her to understand, like, okay, I know this is sort of his way of dealing with things. And when she's tuned up and you just want to run, you're saying, okay, I know this is her way of dealing with, with things. Like just the knowledge of that has helped us a ton. It sounds like the same. Yeah. You kind of sp start speaking the same language. And yeah, my, my wife is similar where if, if I'm being avoidant, um, she's going to start creating her own narratives yeah. and they're usually not generous to either of us, but mostly to herself. It's like, she thinks of the worst, like I think is very common. Mm -hmm. Um, and so as she shares, I get to share my side and 
hopefully, you know, to dispel whatever story has been ruminating in her mind. Yeah. Yeah. With your dad, have you had the conversations with him? I think you've been trying to have or have tried to have um, about maybe the way in which you were raised. You know, uh, I, I don't know exactly what your intention is with those conversations or if you've had them, but do you mind just diving into that yeah. a little bit? We haven't quite had the conversation that I've been wanting to have, but I have. Because of him or because of you? Well, that's a good question. He doesn't, he lives, he lives in Arizona. And so I don't see him very often. We don't talk on the phone, really. We text every now and then. Um, so I'd say the ball is definitely more in my court because I don't even know that this is on his mind. Uh, but what I have done is I've sent him a few texts that have been just sharing my gratitude for, for everything he's done and how proud I am that he's my dad. And so, you know, thankful for all that I learned and, uh, knowing that it wasn't easy being a dad and, um, yeah. So just to try to almost just get the ball rolling with it and, um, just whatever he may be feeling around that. And, and again, I have no idea. He's not responding to it. He's not, he, uh, no, he's, greatly appreciated the texts and yeah, like really received them. I just don't know like what, how he looks upon his life as a dad. What's the conversation that you want to have, but you're not? I'm just curious about what it was like for him being a dad, you know, cause just like I was saying with my wife, like without actually having the conversation, I just create stories. Now the stories have, been uh again much more generous today than they used to be sure but i'd actually like to know just to better understand him why haven't you just asked that question i don't know because maybe i haven't thought about it that way yeah it's interesting i i wonder the same it's it's not yeah look i had a great upbringing my father i don't blame him for anything like you it sounds like you know but there's definitely when i think about when I think about some of the things that I am or the ways of, I mean, like you said, I see my father and me sometimes with my kids, it's like, holy cow, it's so true what they say, right? Like, yes. become your dad. Um, he's at a point in life where I worry about his health. He's getting up there. He's not, you know, he doesn't take care of himself really well. Uh, I actually thought about doing a podcast with him, which would be, I mean, he's not the most open guy. So, which would be a completely, that would be interesting. I but thought about it too, to be honest with right? you. It, yeah. it would be interesting. Just like turn on Zoom and just start talking. And and what, whether I release it or don't release it, it doesn't matter. I've got it. My kids have it. Generations have it. That's kind of what's in my mind about it. Um, but I don't, I, yeah, I, I wonder about the, it sounds like you're, you and your father had more of a, if I'm reading into it, maybe more of a butting of heads over time than maybe my dad and I have. My dad's always been supportive, always worried, but just not. You know, he's yeah. not the most open guy. He would, this isn't the kind of conversation he'd be involved in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to have a conversation with him, I know I need to, but I'm not either. So yeah, for you, I'm, uh, yeah, I guess. Well, I, I love that you asked me that um, and with the follow up. And so I think that that's probably all the inspiration I need to, to. <laughs> How do you think he'll receive step? it? Just your, your take. If you just simply ask him, what I'm, was it like for you being a dad? Will he be receptive to it or like, what the fuck do you want from me right now? <laughs> no, I think he'd be receptive. Um, and I've wanted to do it in person. And so I think that's a little bit of a limiter, but it actually doesn't need to happen in person. It might be easier for him, not in person. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I love that. Pretty cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. Why not? I know. I, I, same. I have to hold each other accountable to this, yes. right? Like have the conversation with our fathers about whatever it is, is on our hearts. Uh, and just honestly, that's what I want to learn. There's so many stories I've heard of him filtered by my mother or whatever. And he's just not the guy to open up. And that's part of what I want to know. It's less, I need to approach you or I need to uh, confront you on something. And it yeah. sounds like that's where you are right now. It's yeah. not that you need to confront him, but I want to know. And at there, how old's your dad? He's uh, 74. 1949. 75 actually. Yeah. My dad's 19, so 74. He'll be in July. Um, they're just such different people. Has he been around your kids when they were young or was that mm -hmm. not, was he softer with them than he was with you? A hundred percent. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you son of a bitch. Right. Like yeah. I, I remember getting on my kids and my father like, Hey, hey, I'm like, 
who the fuck are you? Who the yeah. who, who is this guy? Like yeah. I would have been dragged out by my hoodie. Are yeah. you kidding me? So it's funny to see the where they are. And I do I I have to do this, as do you, it sounds like yes. I have to ask their perspective now. And I'm really curious. Cause I see it as a 40 something year old guy now, right? Like I'm such a different guy than I was at 30. Like my perspective completely different. So what is it? 70, 75, you know? Yeah. A lot of miles. Right. Yep. It's very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, Cal, what, um, what's the next step for you? You've got the great unlearn. You mentioned you don't really set goals, but it sounds like you have visions and ideas of where you want to go. Where are you going with all of this? Well, I have a book that's going to be coming out in the fall. Cool. Is it called The Great Unlearned? We're, it's, it's the title, the title, we haven't quite nailed it, but it is around unlearn. Are you basing it on the podcast? Lessons from the podcast? It's No, it's based on, uh, it's a bit of a memoir. And so just kind of taking people through, you know, kind of lessons I learned as a trader and you know, in some ways how that applies to life, but also just some of the stuff we shared here, like what my journey has looked like. And, and really the goal is to give uh, people permission to be curious about their own lives and to look at things differently and to be okay with things not being okay and, and let them know that we've all got our shit and um, it's not like a how to or a seven steps to, you know, there's no like try to reverse engineer what I've done to have this amazing life. It's like, look, I'm still in the shit from time to time. And, and this is just, these are some of the things I do that, that help me. And sometimes they don't. And, and it's really, I think a really honest account of, you know, life's life can be hard um, and that's okay. There's a lot of, a lot of great, you know, again, I hate to use the word unlearning, but there's, there's, there's so much out there when, you know, we go from black and white to gray and we become curious like that being in that, that state of inquiry for me has been life changing. Um, you know, I was always so sure of myself and had an opinion and I just like let go of a lot of that stuff. And um, it's really helped me really learn, learn from others and then apply that to my own experience. And so then I really have what I feel like is a truth um, about whatever it may be. Yeah. I, the word you used earlier that I, I feel in a lot of what you're, what, where you're going, what you're doing, how you're developing that I'm learning from you is surrender. I love that word that you used it. It made a lot of sense when you said it uh, around, you know, surrendering to the soccer when you're in that moment. Uh, and I even, honestly, what I love about how you message this stuff is that you give permission to not be perfect in it. So mm. surrender isn't this serene, like I have surrendered. Like you said, go have a drink and yeah. numb yourself every so often because yeah. it just sucks it's okay. too much some days. It's okay, right? Yeah. But that idea of surrender and allowing yourself to be is, uh, it's so, I don't know, woo, but. Mm -hmm. it's so essential man. and anything, right? Like this is where I am. It's the, I, it's the, it's the essence of presence. Fair. A hundred percent. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And it's not just to lay down and, you know, let yourself get run over, but it's like just to be in acceptance of what's happening. And I think once we do that, we, we start to move through it and we start to take the little lessons, um, yeah. without having to do it in, in retrospect, which, there's a lot of that as well, but you just, you just being present with it. There's well, the pro grid league was a surrender in some ways, right? Yeah. That, that action, that path, you were surrendering to a calling. Yeah. Let me, one more quick question. I wanted to ask you earlier. I just remembered it yeah. now on that point. I ask a lot of guests this question. I'm always curious about it. I feel like I'm the shiny object King. A lot of us do in the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. space. Everybody's oh, shiny object syndrome, right? And I love what you said, like kind of surrendering to or or being open to the the, the direction you're being called to, like kind of listening and, and being okay with that. Uh, I think you said earlier, like when you feel restricted, that's a sign not to when you feel open. Now, I feel open sometimes, a lot of times to things that may not be that might be more shiny object distraction than they are, you know, hell yeah, down that path. Let's go. How do you delineate the two? How do you discriminate between the two, if at all? I mean, if I'm really in a good place and 
full alignment, then my intuition takes over. And when I'm not, like I kind of follow, I can follow both. Yeah. And eventually the shiny object, you know, appears as just the shiny object. It's like, oh, that was interesting. Okay. <laughs> I missed that one. Yeah. You know, and I think it's okay to to just explore. And it's like, well, why did I think that was going to be the thing? What was going on with me? And it generally, it always comes down to that. If I don't have a good sense of self and I'm feeling less than, or then I will start to, you know, fall into some old patterns and that's okay. Yeah. You know, just being able to recognize it, zoom out and see what I need to do in my life to make myself feel like I'm enough. Um, and then hopefully get back to center. I love it, man. The Great Unlearn is the podcast book in the fall. Best place to follow or learn more about you? Probably on Instagram, cal.callahan. Um, and then my website, thegreatunlearn.com. Yeah, amazing, brother. Appreciate you coming. Thank you, man. Yeah. This is awesome. This is fun. It. Yeah, this is great.